Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during the presentations today, please type them into the questions section on the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody to the June 9th edition of Crop Talk, and uh, this week we're going to uh, continue on a little bit with the getting ready for spraying. I know a lot of producers have been spraying already, but I think uh, there was a few things that have uh, come up in previous uh, uh, crop talks that uh, we thought that it would be good to get out a little bit more information. So uh, we uh, have uh, Allison Sass and Timmy OJ uh, on again uh, this week, and uh, they're going to go through our Manitoba Ag Weather System, our stations, I should say, and look, uh, you know, using the technology. So, uh, how to use the weather station information, a little bit about the spray craft, spray cast, and then, uh, and then maybe a few comments on on the drought forecasting maps and how things have been going. And uh, and then after that, we'll go and get into our crop scouting panel where we've uh, received a few more questions this week. So we will try to get them answered for you. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to just have a couple slides here to get things going. Um, looking at our seeding progress, uh, well, 99% is pretty much 100%, and I think what's basically left is uh, we're seeing some reseeding, and maybe we're seeing the odd bit of uh, feed grains uh, or uh, green feed being put in by some producers. So uh, uh, that's uh, that's happening uh, yet. Uh, just a little brief summary of what I've been seeing over the past week. Uh, dry conditions continue to be an issue throughout most of the province. Uh, of course, last night we did receive some rainfall. Um, seems like the rainfall kind of went at an angle through the Killarney, Portage, Manitou area up that way, uh, where they received the majority of the, or the most measurable, I should say, rainfalls. Uh, there's some spotty areas uh, west of that that received, you know, five. Uh, millimeters, maybe 10 millimeters, but a lot of the areas to the west are reporting less than five millimeters. So uh, an area to the west of the province that's still uh, is still definitely going to be in some dry conditions until the until the next system comes through, or until maybe we get some more rain this afternoon or later on today. Um, past week, uh, several producers have been spraying for for weeds and crop. Um, Wind, I guess, is a big issue, and we're having a lot of producers having to battle windy conditions, trying to get the crop sprayed. As the uh, even though with the dry condition, the crop and the weeds seems to still be advancing and getting into different leaf stages. So a lot of producers are trying to keep on top of that. I guess one of the major issues we've been facing is uh, because of the dry conditions is our our flea beetle issues and our flea beetle problems, and lots of fields are being sprayed right now. And uh, we've had uh, some producers uh, looking at reseeding, and I think there's a lot of questions that have been coming up about uh, plant counts and stands that way. Um, I think one of our biggest, uh, 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 I guess, non-crop issue is pasture and hayland. Uh, they're definitely showing effects of the dry conditions. Um, I'm seeing uh, pastures that were overgrazed last fall or last year. Uh, are definitely in bad shape right now, and uh, uh, producers are putting cattle back out onto those pastures. And I got a feeling that they, are, if we don't get any significant rain shortly, those pastures are going to be uh, be done with fairly quickly. And uh, just from going out into some forage fields uh, right now, the, uh, it's looking like first cut is going to be uh, uh, lower than average. Uh, again, unless we receive uh, a rainfall fairly quickly here, some of the uh, Grasses are starting to uh, are begin heading out, and uh, so we need it uh, need some rain to get it, get them to stretch out a little bit. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our presenters for today, and I think Allison is going to be uh, presenting uh, a large portion of it, and Timmy's there to help answer questions. So, uh, Allison, if you would like to take it over. Sure. There we go. How are you seeing things? Do I need to swap? Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, good morning, everyone, um, and thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Allison Sass. I'm the Ag Meteorology Specialist uh, with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. And also on the line, I have uh, Timmy Ojo, uh, who is our Ag uh, Modeler. Uh, and today we're going to go over um, basically a more in-depth way or a more in-depth example of how to uh, use our weather sites to get the information that you need um, for spraying. I know Kim provided a, a really wonderful in-depth account of things to consider uh, last week on our crop talk um, when making spray decisions and we're just going to kind of dive in a little deeper into the weather part of that. So what weather variables are important uh, when you're spraying? So mainly wind speed and wind direction are very important, as well as temperature and humidity. Um, so most pesticides have recommended temperatures and humidities that are ideal for um, the best efficacy, um, as well as you want to keep the forecast in mind. So you want to know what if, uh, conditions are coming your way and even the time of day has an impact on uh, your decisions. So where can I get live weather information? So live weather information is really what you want when you're making those last minute uh, decisions. So our uh, Manitoba government uh, ag weather network um, has 111 weather stations throughout Agro Manitoba and we are growing that to fill in some gaps apps as well. Um, the information from our weather stations updates every 15 minutes through the growing season, so it's pretty up to date. Um, there's no charge for our information at all, and we don't have an app. However, if you're looking to access it on a mobile device, you can save uh, our, our link to your home screen, so it looks like an app um, when you're on your, your mobile device, and our site is mobile friendly. There's also a variety of private networks throughout the province that offer live data as well. However, most of these are subscription-based um, and there's, there's quite a few to choose from. And also Environment and Climate Change Canada has a uh, website as well and they provide update, their information is updated every hour, so not quite as live as you might need it. However, they do, uh, supply really good radar and hourly forecasts as well. And they also have an app. So today I'm going to kind of delve into what we know best and I'm just going to switch here to um, a live demo. So can you see the website okay now? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, great. So I'm going to cover what we know the best, which is our weather network. So the Manitoba Agriculture Weather Program. Um, this is kind of our home page where you can access um, the live data as well as some summary data. And this is at manitoba or gov.mb.ca slash agriculture slash weather slash weather conditions and reports. And here we have current conditions by stations. You can access our interactive map of stations as well as current condition summaries on a more regional basis as well as the hourly, daily and seasonal summaries for the majority of our stations. This location is also where we post our special maps. So anytime there's a significant rainfall event or a high wind event, or in this case, we have quite a few frost reports from previous weeks. We post that on this site as well. We also are posting weather extremes. So usually in the past, we've done this on an annual basis. So you can see here we have the weather extremes for 2020. Um, but we've decided this year to also do the weather extremes month by month for the growing season. So here's an example of the uh, extremes for May, and it just highlights some of the uh, highest temperatures that we saw, for example, the greatest precipitation total, um, highest wind speeds, etc. cetera. 
And then if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, we also have our weekly crop weather reports and weather maps. So this is where we um, show each of those maps that I discussed on our first weather talk or our first crop talk, sorry, uh, webinar uh, back in April. But today we're kind of focusing on the live conditions. So there's two ways to access the live conditions on our site. One way is to go to the current conditions by station and click on that. And this gives you the choice of viewing regional summaries, or you can choose the station summaries from any of our stations in the region. So this might be a little easier uh, if you're on a mobile device um, and you have one station in mind and you don't want to scroll through a map to get to it um, because it's just listed in alphabetical order by region. Uh, but first I'll show you the current condition summary. So I'm going to choose the central, eastern, and interlake first. And this gives you the current conditions updated hourly from all of our stations in those given regions. So you have air temperature, dew point, humidity, average wind speed, maximum wind speed, the average wind direction, the precipitation for the last hour, as well as the precipitation since midnight, and the soil temperature at five and 20 centimeters, and the soil moisture at five and 20 centimeters. So things you might be interested in when you're spraying is definitely the wind speed, the wind direction, and uh, the maximum wind speed. Today, you might be more interested in seeing rainfall for your region. So this is a really good way to kind of get a snapshot of what's ha not happening only in your immediate region or in your immediate station area, but throughout the region, especially if you're located kind of in between some of our stations. Again, as you scroll down, you can access um, the different regions. If you see any data blanked out, that usually means that there's um, a sensor malfunction at that site that we, we're on top of fixing. So again, current condition summary for the Northwest and Southwest is the same. And we also have yesterday's summaries. So if you're interested in um, what happened up until midnight last night, you can click on the yesterday summary. And here we have the max, minimum, and average temperatures, the average relative humidity, average soil temperatures at five and 20 centimeters, average soil moisture at five and 20 centimeters, the maximum wind speed, and the total precipitation and the total evapotranspiration, which is something that you might want to consider during spraying as well. And these run again from 12 a.m. to 12 a.m. for the whole day. So if we move down to the station summaries and choose a station, I'll choose Altona. This will take you to the live data page. So this information is updated every 15 minutes. So it says 9 a.m. right now. It's just turned to 9.15. So if I refresh this after I speak, um, it'll probably update. So here we have all the live information. So air temperature, relative humidity, dew point, pressure, the precipitation for the last hour, as well as the precipitation since midnight, the average wind speed and direction, and the maximum wind gusts. We also have the soil temperature and soil moisture, the volumetric moisture content at all four depths, so 5, 20, 50, and 100 centimeter depths. And then we post the information on graphs as well. So we have the air temperature and relative humidity for the last um, two days. Also a good way to look at if there's any, um, this is a really great way to see if there's any frost or um, if there is extremely high temperatures yesterday. Um, 
Then we move on to the wind speed and wind direction graph. Um, so we have the average wind speed is the blue line. Maximum wind speed is the blue squares. And the wind direction is the yellowy green line. And so the wind direction is given in degrees. So 0 to 360. So 0 and 360 degrees is north. And the cardinals are given on the side here. So north, west, south, east. We also have precipitation for the last two weeks. And this is updated daily. So the last date you'll see here is June 8th. As well as the soil moisture and soil temperature graphs. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that we have yesterday's summary for this station as well. So again, max, min, and average temperatures, the maximum, minimum, and average humidity, precipitation for the day yesterday, the average and maximum wind speed, the evapotranspiration, and the average soil temperature and soil moisture. So going back to the first page that we looked at, which is the weather conditions and reports, there's an additional way to access that live data, and it's a little bit more visual. So if you click on the current conditions interactive map, that'll take you to our agri maps. And this page will show the locations of all of our weather stations. So the first tab that shows up is the weather stations tab. And you can zoom in either using the plus or minus on the left hand side here, or you can use the wheel on your mouse to scroll in. And the closer you get, then the more information you get. So you have um, the station names come up. Now this just shows you where the weather stations are. If you want to link directly to the live station page, you simply have to click on one of the station dots and go to more info. However, before we do that, I'll show you some of the other uh, variables that we post on the maps. So any of these parameters at the top of the page, as well as we have soil moisture and barometric pressure, um, will show up on the map. So if you zoom out, you'll see here's our air temperature maps. Scroll down on the left-hand side of the page and it'll show you the, uh, the legend. So most of the stations in the Agro Manitoba right now are between 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, except for this one, which is minus 39 and argue. So that is an error. And if you zoom in on the map, it'll show you the live state, the live conditions for those stations. And if you click on a given station, it'll show you the actual air temperature, station name, as well as the last update. So this map, I believe, updates every hour. And again, you can link to more info. Again, same thing for relative humidity. If you click on the relative humidity tab at the top of the page, it'll give you the current um, relative humidity. Precipitation as well. I'm just going to zoom out for a second. So the precipitation, if you look at the left-hand side of the map, you'll see that we have two options to select. Oops. You can either select the precipitation for the last hour, which is the default setting. So right now it's showing me the precipitation for the last hour. And again, you scroll down to view the legend, or you can choose precipitation since midnight. So we're viewing precipitation during uh, since midnight right now. And this gives you a really good snapshot of where uh, the most precipitation has been received if you're looking more on a provincial level. So you can see um, this area kind of in the central region seems to have received the most rainfall since midnight. Um, still pretty dry out in the southwest. 
And again, if we want to zoom in to see um, those exact values, we can zoom in. So again, looks like from this region, looks like the maximum is at our station here in Manitou, who's received almost 73 millimeters of rain. And if you want to view more info, again, the link is there. And the final one I'll show is wind speed and wind direction. So the arrows point to the direction um, from the wind direction. So this wind speed, wind direction would be um, from the east. And again, it shows you the um, most current average wind speed. And if you click on that station or that arrow, it'll give you the average wind speed, the gusting to, and the average wind direction. So now we're gonna click on more info. And again, that'll take you to the live data page. And you'll notice that this station, again, has updated at 9.15 now. If you are looking at the station, so if you have this page on your desktop while you're working on a different screen, um, you do have to manually refresh it to view the, the live data. So it doesn't automatically refresh. So if I don't refresh it at 9.30, it's gonna keep showing the 9.15 information. Okay, I think that's, it. Um, oh, one thing to consider too when you're um, looking at wind speed and wind direction for spraying decisions, you have to remember that wind speed is very relative. So very small things can impact wind speed. Um, and one of those things is the height that the sensor is located. So we measure our wind speed and wind direction at 10 meters, which is at the very top of our towers. Um, that is the World Meteorological Organization standards. Um, but you have to consider too that you're not spraying at 10 meters as well. So just something to consider. And also our stations are installed at a variety of locations. Um, the majority are installed in very accurate locations when we we choose a location where we're going to get the most accurate wind speed so we try to avoid shelter belts and um, wind obstructions as well but if you're looking at other networks um, keep in mind that sometimes the wind directions and, and wind speeds are taken at different heights so just can you uh, okay, um, actually, um, I got a question that just come in. Uh, would it be possible to display for each weather station site the year-to-date precipitation and heat units received and have a relative comparison to normals? That information um, is given in our uh, it's we we don't do that on like the live maps. We do have a seasonal summary. Unfortunately, not all of our stations are displayed here. So here you can choose your starting date and your end date. And I'm going to use Altona again. So this shows um, the number of actual growing degree days and the percent normal that does not look right. Um, for the season and then yeah I'm not sure Tim you might be able to help decipher why this isn't showing up yeah, yeah um can you hear me okay yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay great yeah so basically um the update well this seasonal summary hasn't been updated for a while and that's because the software that we use to create that seasonal summary and daily and hourly page um, is actually is out of date so we are currently working on Aquarius is the new software we're working on um, we are hoping that it would be we actually hope that it would have been re released by now but again I think COVID and a few other things um, reprioritize the IT folks um, work schedule so 
it's something that we are hoping that at some point we're able to release the new software that would have the GDDCHU for each location. Um, at that point, we would likely have another crop talk or a webinar to really just help folks understand how to navigate that new system. But it's going to look quite different from what this is. But it's going to have all the historical data such that you, like people are able to see, you know, data since the station was pretty much installed. So maybe 10 years of data for some location. And then we would also create, and again, comparison to normal um, GDD, CHU, and the like. So it's it's going to be a more robust software um, once it's launched. But at this point, we are unable to have additional capability on this software because this software has been something we've been using for the last, um, I think, f almost 15 years or so. So it, it, it's actually out of date. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry about that. I kind of forgot. I got all excited. I'm like, oh, we do have a summary, but I forgot that it's uh, a little out of date. But in the meantime, um, you can access the heat units and precipitation and that for the season through our crop weather reports. So we put these out every Monday. Usually they're published to the website late Monday or early Tuesday morning, or you can subscribe. There's a little button here to have them emailed to you. So this is on the that homepage that I started on again, the weather conditions and reports. And if you look at the uh, crop weather report, it gives you a station by station um, rundown. It's only since May, um, it's for the week. So from May 31st to June 6th uh, was, was our last one. Um, and it gives you the maximum temperatures, the rainfall for that period, the growing degree days, uh, since May 1st, corn heat units since May 1st, and the rainfall since May 1st, as well as the comparison to normal for each of the heat units and the rainfall. And we do archive these as well. So if you wanted to go back and see um, older reports, uh, you can view them again right underneath. So that's where you can find the heat units by station by station, as well as the precipitation um, versus normal for the growing season. We also publish crop weather reports throughout the winter. They're a little abbreviated and they don't include the heat units, but they do include the temperature and uh, precipitation throughout the winter as well. Okay, and I think uh, uh, just to say a comment uh, that was made uh, regarding the, uh, the corn heat units and the, uh, and the uh, precipitation, I guess it would, uh, if that would be something that could be added on uh, so you don't have to go through all the different searches, uh, the site sort of, I guess they were asking if it could be put on, you know, if I clicked on brand and if it could come up on brand and site with, with all that information. And is that something that they're looking uh, to do for the next, uh, the next pro, uh, program stuff information we get? Yeah, so some of the updates we're looking at, because again, with what Alison showed, um, the crop report have a static date. May 1st is when we start the crop report, and we kind of just accumulate the corn heat units that way. But with the new program we're hoping to roll out, it would actually have a user-defined start date, because not everyone seeded on May 1st. So you would be able to actually select the date of interest. Now on the individual home pages that we have for each station, um, we can add those to it right now. However, the challenge is that sometimes, especially for some of these cumulative units, there are some times that we have sense of failure and one day we don't have any data. So that way it actually really impacts the cumulative and we were actually discussing including the month summary as well for, for precipitation. So th there are a lot of technical, I would say, challenges that we're trying to navigate in updating the page and also making sure that we stay within the limit, um, the capacity that this software allows us to, to, to update. So we are kind of being cautious about what we add on to the current system, but trying to focus more on the new and improved um, system that we are building. But again, uh, it's really my hope that at some point it would be released to the public, but it's something we're still working on in the background. Okay, um, 
another question that came in is um, regarding the wind and, and wind speed maps and, and according like the time of day and everything. Can you go back uh, or does it have the ability to go back a week ago or I guess the question comes in because if it's a drift complaint, we may not know about it for a week. And then can we go back a week in the data to find out what the wind speed and direction was at a certain time? Yeah, so Alison, if you want to click on the hourly summary on that same page, um, it doesn't have all the stations um, again, but yeah, if you click on say auto and I change the date, uh, we likely won't have today's date there yet, but maybe change it to let's say a week ago. Um, you would actually see the information for that. Yeah, so we do have the wind speed um, and wind direction by the hour. So if it's the information that you know folks are looking for, we have that for some location, not all the locations. Many of the new stations we've installed um, in the last few years have not been updated on this site yet. And I should also say that we collect this information actually in 15 minutes as well. So for drift complaint, for instance, hourly wind speed may not be what you need. You may want um, a higher resolution data. So for that, you know, you can email Alison or myself and we'll be happy to look into the database and provide the 15 minute data, um, both the average wind speed and the peak wind speed for the specific period of interest. Okay. Um, another question just came in. Uh, hi there. Uh, when I try to download previous growing season data for a station, it does not do it. Any suggestions on how to get it for April till October growing season? Yeah, so, so same deal as this. So this shows our reports, but if Alison goes back and selects daily, um, you should be able to have the daily, yeah, yeah, the daily summary. And again, yeah, Recognite doesn't have the data for all the um, location, but for the locations that are there, you should be able to see the data. Yeah, so this is from April 15 up until two days ago, thereabout, and it would provide you again based on the date you've selected, the precipitation total from April 15 till now at that location at Altona. I think it's showing about 57 millimeters, just more than just a bit um, above two inches of rain since April 15. Um, the GDD 30, well, 331. So again, it gives you that information. I know what folks have done in the past is simply copy this out. So if you highlight from April 15 and then you highlight it and click go all the way down, you can actually copy it and paste it in an Excel spreadsheet and kind of yeah, use as you want. Um, the other alternative, again, if you want like tons of data, which um, it's a good thing that the network is being like highly visible and really well used um, for people that want more, I'd say, advanced data, they can contact Alison or myself, and um, we are always happy to help to provide as much data as possible. Now, that's also why we are going on with the new system, such that in the new system, we hope that you know you would actually be able to have the data there, and you can export the data as a PNG, as Excel, in, in different formats. And, and again, that's why we are going through that process because this current system, like I said, is outdated. So you have to manually highlight and copy it out. But with the new system, you'll be able to actually export it in different formats. Okay, that's great. Uh, one more question. Um, uh, what height is uh, temperature taken at and uh, would a ground level sensor be a uh, better indicator for determining actual temperature affecting crop and the examples in frost situations. Yes, so basically the air temperature I think is at 1.5 or 2 meters. I have to, have to look my, my, my notes again, but yeah, it, it's around that 2 meter height is where we take temperature at. And you don't want to take temperature at the ground level because again, um, you can have influence from vegetation right away. Um, and again, you don't, because if we 
put the sensor at ground level that means that as the vegetation grows and you know the height of the vegetation increases we have to be moving it up and up otherwise we would simply be monitoring the vegetation temperature and not the air temperature um, so that's why we don't do that um, and i know alison is still gonna maybe just um, part of the last bit of the presentation was to look at the temperature inversion and that's something that we were looking at 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 least three locations currently in terms of determining um, putting the temperature sensor at three different heights or so maybe 0 0.5, 1.5 and then maybe three meters such that we're able to determine inversion um, but for now in terms of frost determination I think air temperature at the standard recommended height is still where we want to be um, Although yeah, it may not give us exactly, let's say, to the you know two decimal point what the air temperature is, but it's still the recommended board meteorological organization standard height. Okay, and one last uh, question is: uh, Could you maybe just explain uh, regarding the drought forecasting maps and uh, the differences we're seeing? Uh, between say Saskatchewan and ours or Ag Canada, uh, if you could go through that. Okay, I think Alison has a slide on that. Yep. Uh, so I'll skip to that um, part. So um, I'll just continue on. There was um, a couple more things that I was going to mention um, before finishing up, and I do have some comments on the drought maps. Um, so just another option or another uh, reference for uh, making spray decisions is uh, Spraycast. And um, the, the website is given on the bottom here. Hopefully you can see my screen okay. Um, and if you click any region on this map, again, it's focused towards the potato growing regions. Um, it'll give you some suggestions on um, when it's recommended to spray versus not. And again, this is based on, I think more focused on potatoes. Um, and then uh, it has different droplet sizes as well. I'm not as familiar with the inputs to this tool, so I'm not gonna expand on it too much, but I did want it, want to bring it to your attention as well. Um, and the final thing that you want to consider during um, make, while making your spray decisions is you want to avoid, um, you want to be mindful of the potential of temperature inversions. And I know Kim mentioned this uh, last week as, as well, but um, just kind of wanted to remind you and give a little more summary on this. I found this information on the North Dakota State University page, which provides a really great summary on how temperature inversions um, can relate to pesticide applications. Uh, and we also have a really good description of temperature inversions with regards to smoke dispersion uh, when you're crop residue burning on the Manitoba government website as well. So temperature inversions occur when the surface temperature near the ground surface is cooler than the temperature at a higher height. So this causes the air between the two temperature differences to stabilize the water vapor and water droplets, which can cause them to move very far distances depending on droplet size, even up to kilometers horizontally between those two areas. An indication that a temperature inversion is occurring or might occur is fog and dew. And so you want to avoid spraying during a temperature inversion because your spray can travel great distances and you're not going to be spraying where you want to. Um, currently, uh, we have three stations um, in our weather network that measure temperature at different heights. So we have one in Minidosa, one in Winkler, and I believe one in Woodlands that measure temperature at three different heights. And we're kind of doing this as a proof of concept um, to see if we want to expand that um, any farther. I don't think that information is available to the public, um, the three different temperatures, but it allows us to kind of view it on our back end uh, to see where those inversions might be occurring. So common conditions that can contribute to temperature inversions 
um, greater wind speed, so wind speeds over five to eight kilometers actually weakens um, inversions. Um, cloud cover, so if there's more cloud, there is slower surface cooling, and then the slower inversion will occur in the afternoon or evening. So clouds are good. <laughs> Um, dew and frost, just like I mentioned before, uh, are indicators that an inversion is forming. So dew occurs when the soil surface and the air near the soil surface are cool. And with fog, the relative humidity um, is actually 100% when fog occurs, so there can't be any evaporation. And this causes pesticide droplets. That means that they're not going to evaporate either and they'll actually move downwind instead of evaporating. Cultivation can cause inversions to form more quickly and intensely uh, over recently tilled soil. So this causes, cultivation can cause the soil to dry more quickly. This increases the pore space, which decreases the thermal conductivity, which means that the surface temperature will be greater during the day and lower during the night, which can contribute to that um, inversion. And the closed crop canopy um, can also cause inversions to form earlier in the evening and be more intense over than if it was over bare soil. So basically the plants have a low heat capacity and they can cool very quickly. The leaves, uh, closer to the surface, so the lower leaves will remain warm because they're protected from the clear sky by the upper leaves, and the upper leaves will cool to a lower temperature than the bare soil. So again, they'll in, the inversions over a closed crop will likely form sooner in the evening. And again, this is very generalized um, accounts of what can contribute. So moving on to the uh, soil maps and drought maps, um, I'm going to start by saying I'm not familiar with all the information that goes into developing these uh, drought maps. So uh, this one right here is the one from Agriculture Canada uh, that was produced on April 30th. Um, so we can't comment too much on what goes into these maps and if they're correct or not or whatever. But we have had some questions about um, comparing these maps to the maps that we produce on a weekly basis. Um, the maps that we produce are basically soil moisture maps. And for a more detailed information on the information we use in those maps, uh, I recommend you viewing the crop talk that we did on May 12th. It was a really in-depth look at soil moisture and how to interpret that data. So when comparing a drought map such as this to a, uh, a map such as ours, so this is the uh, top 30 centimeter soil moisture map that we produced on May 2nd. And again, this map from Agriculture Canada was produced on April 30th. So there's a couple of days difference in there. And you can see that it looks a little different. Um, the drought map is predicting, I believe, I'm just gonna jump back and look at the, so extreme drought um, for a good portion of the Southwest, whereas, our conditions are saying optimal. And again, optimal is a label that we've just assigned to that range. So it's almost preferable to look at the moisture condition by percentage. Um, and optimal is, is again relative to saturation. Um, so you can see that again, we don't have a lot of areas that are recording as dry. And there's a couple of things to consider when comparing these maps. These maps are showing different things. So it's not really comparing apples to apples. Um, the drought map isn't instantaneous, whereas ours is. 
So if we receive a little bit of rain the day before we produce our map, it will cause a change in our map. However, if that little bit of rain happens, the drought maps are made over a longer index and a longer period of time. And those minor rainfalls might not be as visible of a change in a drought map as it will to ours. And also, um, I believe, and I can be corrected if I'm wrong, that the drought maps are likely taking into account more surface moisture than ours. So again, this is a ours is a zero to 30 centimeters, whereas the drought map may be only zero to five centimeters. And that can vary quite differently and um, can contribute to a, a higher moisture reading than just considering the top layer of soil. And we also have a large range for our soil conditions. So for example, that optimum range or optimal range is between 40 and 70%. So if Austin is reading optimal, it could have a moisture reading of 40.1 or 69.9%. So it's, you have to keep that in mind as well. And ours is, our map is very much a snapshot of a point in time at a specific location. And so the way that the maps are interpolated are probably very different as well. And again, I'm not familiar with all of the inputs that go into the drought maps. Yeah, Alison, can I add quickly here as well? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, I think the drought map also, I think um, it also incorporates the stream flow. It incorporates the Palma drought index, and that is an index for how things have been dry over an extended period of time. So I think just very similar to what you mentioned, that the map we produce is an instantaneous, like what's happening at that location at an instance. Um, compared to a drought map that looks at a legacy index. So, for instance, with the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada drought map, if you look at the drought map, um, the map ev um, evolution, it actually started showing the drought, I think, since last September thereabouts. So even if we, uh, with some location that received um, a bit of precipitation in the fall, not a whole lot, but some location did receive that, but because it's a legacy index, receiving even it, a day like today, we have some location that received say two inches of precipitation. If we produce our map today, it's gonna show very wet. However, the drought map may only slightly improve things from being at extreme drought to maybe severe drought, despite the fact that we received two inches of rain because two inches isn't enough to actually make up for all the dryness we've had that has accumulated over the last say six, seven, eight months or so. So again, it's it's two different things, two different information that has been presented and both of them have use, uses. And I always say again, with the drought map, it gives you an indication of a legacy um, period over time, how things have evolved over time. But our current condition map, our soil moisture map tells you what is happening right now without taking into consideration over a period of time. Now, with the, let's say, two inches of rain today and showing very wet, if we map the same location tomorrow, most of the two inches could have actually moved down the profile in like off the root zone, going to the groundwater really quickly because things have been quite dry. And that's why, again, the map we produce is simply instantaneous. So don't look at it beyond the day it was made for, because looking at it beyond that day can actually create a lot of changes if things do change. So again, both, I'd say both maps do have a place depending on what you want to, the information you're seeking for. Okay, good. Um, thanks, uh, Allison and Timmy. Uh, I think uh, now what we'll do is uh, um, if we can get um, uh, Laurie to turn the screen over to me and Allison, and Timmy, if you can hang on, there might be some questions that can come in, but we'll uh, go into the crop scouting panel. Sure. Thanks very much.
Okay, so right into the crop scouting panel, we've got a few questions that have come in, and I think one of the ones that uh, came in earlier last week was the proper method of mixing chemicals. Also, where do micronutrients and foliar feeding products fit into that mixing and insecticides, especially feed beetles? So I think this will be go to Kim, and I think Kim might have a few slides, so we might have to send the screen over to her, Lorraine. Okay, just let me know when you can see stuff. We can. You can? Okay, um, we'll do presenter mode, sorry, and um, from the beginning. Okay, so thanks Lionel for asking. I'll go through this pretty quick because we don't have a lot of time left and I know there's some other questions on the panel. Um, do I need to switch screens, probably? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Anyways, okay, so, and pointer. Okay, now we're moving. Okay, so wham legs, there's other ones called whales and apples. This is probably about the nicest one. This is just something that you should have, any of you retailers or anybody that's got this doing lots with different pesticides. Um, this is a general tank mix order. Um, I've got another slide that goes into a bit more detail, um, but I'll just go through this quickly. So the W stands for wettable powders, flowables, and basically all of these um, formulations, everything from a granule to a dry flowable to uh, suspension granules, suspension particles, all of these different formulations that are basically your dry or your wettable powders and your flowables. After that, you agitate anti-flowing compounds and your buffers go in next. Um, so uh, the next thing into the tank is a micro and capsule suspension, the MEs, we don't have a lot of those. Um, after that then is the L, stands for liquids and solubles, so this is your solutions, your solution concentrates, your liquids and your suspensions. So we do have some of those products. Um, and then our biggest one that we have, the, the most of our products are emulsifiable concentrates. These are, um, that's where your active ingredient is in. Uh, uh, dissolved in a solvent and then when you mix that with water and it's agitated it forms an emulsion so that's why agitation is extremely important um, it will come out of solution eventually if there's no agitation but the bulk of our uh, pesticides that we apply in the herbicide world anyways are ECs and they actually do form nice emulsions in water usually depending what solvent is in there but anyways they come in towards the end here if it's different ECs if if you're mixing and they're all ECs then it really doesn't matter which one goes in first if they're all ECs it doesn't matter which one uh, the G is for your high load glyphosate so we all always said you know glyphosate goes in last but actually your surfactant goes in last if you're putting that in um, when in doubt consult the label um, something like in our guide to crop protection there will be the odd time there's something in there if you look at the liberty label uh, in that case uh, when you're mixing with centurion the mixing order is um, centurion or select sorry you would be put the amigo in first followed by the liberty followed by your clethodim product, but that is actually on our product page, that's in the um, on their label itself, so that is one that's a bit different, um, but again, most of them would follow this order. Um, it's a little bit simplistic, this is again um, right off, I think, the Sprayers 101 website, which is a, an excellent website, I'm going to show you that in a minute too, um, and it actually goes into a little bit more detail about the types of, 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 of uh, formulations in here and um, the liquid flowables, if you're putting some different ones in, in order your suspension concentrates would become before your SEs, which um, becomes before your emulsions in water, which is actually different than an emulsifiable concentrate. Most of the time we don't worry about too much of this, but in case, um, uh, you know, if there is something in doubt, if it's not on the label itself, then this is just a little bit more detail um, that you would want to go to make sure you're getting everything in in order. Um, one thing I did want to talk about, Bayer Crop Science uh, has a really good website and if you go to their, their website and then you look under resources here and then you go to this tank mix list, I've just taken some screenshots of their website, this is their, um, their tank mix list and it's actually their registered and their off-label tank mixes when we're talking about um, DSIS. When you're talking about Centurion and Liberty, it is a Bayer supported tank mix, so it's not registered, but it is supported by Bayer. Uh, here's your mixing order here for Invigor Canola. 
Here is Liberty um, with Liberty and Desis. There's your mixing order, Liberty first, followed by Desis for your bigger canola. And for all of your Roundup brands as well, these are supported tank mixes. They're not registered. If it is a registered tank mix, it will be in the guide. It will be on the label and it will be in the guide um, under the tank mix section. Our tank mix section has herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides. And lots of times you'll see that none are registered, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not supported. And uh, so again, so this is Roundup Brands, and that's the Desis followed with the Roundup goes in after the Desis, um, and then your Roundup Ready canola for your and your Roundup Ready crops. So basically, Bayer has a great website. The other companies as well will have lists of supported tank mixes. Um, other tank mixes, Liberty and Seven is supported. Again, you would follow the the WAM legs uh, protocol for mixing order on that. Anything else, check with manufacturer, and I would be checking with both manufacturers just to make sure that it's a supported tank mix. Talking about other herbicides and other micronutrients, you need to check with all companies involved, um, especially uh, I would be, I'm always leery of throwing something in. One company will say it's fine to throw in. I would, uh, I would make sure all companies say it's okay to throw in. Um, just I know we've got lots of issues. We don't want to be compromising those herbicides that we're spraying. Um, we can't have them not work because we need the weed control and we want them to work really well because we don't want to be contributing to resistance by having them, you know, half kill something or almost kill something because they were compromised. Um, one more thing on the Sprayers 101 uh, website, do a jar test. And a jar test is basically like a mini, a mini spray. Whatever's going in your sprayer, you just need to put it in. Make sure it's not going to uh, settle out, sediment out, or gel, um, because we'd rather see that happen in a jar uh, than on than in your sprayer. So if you go to the Sprayers 101 website, I think they actually have a video of how to do it as well. But they have the steps in here. This was this is from Jason and Mike Cobro, who's um, the Omafra weed management specialist in Ontario there. And basically the jar test, we don't have to go through this, but this is their steps. And you're going to basically start with a glass jar because we want to be able to see it. You're going to um, you're going to shake all your products first. You're going to put a little bit of water in, like you're going to add one cup of water to that one liter glass jar. Um, if you're putting in oil or fertilizers, add a little bit more. And then you're going to start putting your products in in the mixing order based on that WAM legs um, um, acronym up above. So you need to put them in in the same order and you need to see if they're going to gel out and then you need to sit, let it sit for a while. So you need to wait and you need to make sure that your dry products and your water soluble packets are fully dispersed before you add the wet stuff in. Um, and again, you need to wait a few minutes. It just shouldn't take very long. And um, then you end up topping it up to top, get it half full. You can measure the pH on it. Some of our herbicides will drop the pH quite substantially. So you need to watch that. Um, and then after that, you let it sit in a ventilated area for 15 minutes and um, check the results. If it's giving off heat, these ingredients are not compatible. If a gel or a scum forms or solids settle to the bottom, um, except for the wettable powders, then the mixture is likely not compatible. And all this does is for physical, it, it shows you physical compatibility or incompatibility. It doesn't reveal any other form of antagonism. So we still don't know whether or not um, this, whatever you're trying to throw in a spray tank, um, it, just because it mixes and doesn't gel and doesn't settle out, it still doesn't mean that that's the right thing to do. And it doesn't mean it's not compromising the products that you've been adding to the spray tank. So that's just something to keep in mind. But again, this is on the Sprayers 101 website. That's an excellent resource. And I would encourage you to go there and get the information if you're going to be trying some of this stuff. And yeah, that's all I had for that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kim. Uh, I get Laurie to uh, give me back the screen. And uh, just one comment uh, for uh, the questions that, uh, that Kim was answering uh, regarding uh, micronutrients or nutrient supplements. Uh, Don Heard made a comment that uh, it's uh, really, uh, unless, uh, unless they're warranted through a tissue sample, probably no need to be adding any micronutrients or nutrients to the, uh, to the mix. Uh, and this will go to John or Marla. Uh, canola sown into uh, soybean stubble, direct seeded. Was there something I could have done to stop this from blowing uh, it's uh it was this would have been about on well it was on the weekend it was on saturday that i took this picture so. thanks lionel i'll hit this one and then john can follow up if he has any additional comments 
Uh, so the unfortunate thing is you can't really do anything about it in the moment. Um, and uh, this is one of those tricky conversations uh, to be having where we really just need to be thinking about long-term soil management and sustainability. Um, in a case like uh, canola, say, soy, sown into soybeans in this case, having put in a cover crop following soybeans wouldn't have necessarily been something that was feasible just because it takes a little while to get that cover crop growing and soybeans come off so late. Um, our neighbors to the south in you know, North Dakota and Minnesota, when they're growing their row crops, they often will go through and actually um, inter-row seed their cover crops. But I don't know that that's something that we're going to be seeing as a common occurrence here, just because of the modifications to different planters and such to be able to go in and inter-row seed. And when we don't have a high proportion of cover or of row crops in our rotation, I don't know that that's necessarily going to be something that we're seeing as much of broadcast seeding and other things that could be could be done if you were looking at this as a long term kind of cover crop following a low residue soybean or low residue crop situation. But that being said, in a year like this year, you can't predict the weather as we've already talked about today. And so even if you had had a cover crop growing last year, there's always that chance that that cover crop may have taken up some of that precious soil moisture that we needed to save coming into this dry year. So again, this is a, a tricky situation, but it's really one that if you're decreasing tillage in general, make sure that you're not working that soybean residue um, and kind of thinking about some of these long-term soil management practices to build soil, um, soil organic matter, build soil structure, to be able to retain more moisture, retain more of that soil when it is windy. All of those types of things are things we need to think about. But again, it's a tricky one to be able to manage in the moment. Um, it really is long-term planning, and these are difficult conversations to be having with growers at times, but when we see these types of situations, these are the times that we need to start having those conversations and thinking about how we can change this type of situation. Okay, and John, do you have anything uh, to... to, just, to just to comment that uh, uh, bets are that those soybeans receded into tilled ground, not zero tilled. And so you can't expect a one-year uh, 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 switch of, of, of zero tilling canola into soybean stubble to do the trick. Had a conversation with my neighbor across the fence yesterday on his farm, and he says, hey, the pea stubble is far worse than the canola stubble. So, uh, But maybe your guys out there are all zero tilling their peas, and so they've got something holding that. It's not just last year's residue. It's the benefit of having a longer-term uh, zero till structure at the surface. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I, think I would it was... just add to that, John. Sorry, Sorry, Lionel. I would just add quickly while I'm thinking about this too. The um, it, when we talk about no till, we're talking about like actual no tillage. And so sometimes when you're trying to deal with this residue, um, quite often people are trying to till some of that soybean residue, which can be a bit of a tough residue to um, to deal with in the next year even though it's a lower residue crop, it's a tough residue. And so when we think about trying to manage that residue, we think about using things like high-speed shallow tillage or vertical till type implements. And when we're thinking about using those kinds of implements in any situation, but especially when we're dealing with lower residue crops like soybeans, we do need to consider the fact that that high speed action, if we have that perfect kind of seedbed set up, a lot of the impact of those shallow, um, shallow high speed shallow discs and vertical till units, if they're quite aggressive, means that they really pulverize the soil structure at the surface, which sets us up to be blowing the soil in the spring if it is dry or windy. And even if it's not that dry, if it's windy at all, it gets dry on the surface and it can start to move. So that is something we need to consider too. Lower impact tillage does not always mean that low uh, depth of tillage is low impact. So if you're using any kind of equipment going over the field that is busting up that soil surface, that is also setting us up for a problem in the future in this type of situation. Okay, good, thanks guys. Uh, next question goes to John Gablowski. Um, flea beetles have been a pretty big problem. 
uh, in the last uh, week uh, or 10 days here. And a uh, question from a producer that uh, I took these pictures on was, uh, how do I manage my next 10 days? Uh, how long do I wait? When am I out of the woods? They seem to be taking down bigger plants. When do we get uh, get so many per plant? Is one spray enough? Okay, so I'll start with the, I guess the first question. Uh, when will the population start dropping on you? Uh, normally by about mid-June, by about that third week in June, we normally start to see levels declining and normally by the end of June, they've gotten quite low. So by then you're, you're almost always out of the woods timing-wise um, for the flea beetles. Now regarding the plants, your plants will remain susceptible until they have at least three to four true leaves. So anything that's still going to be in that seedling stage for the next week to two weeks will still be uh, quite susceptible. So you've got another week or two before you're out of the woods if your canola is going to be struggling to get to that three to four leaf stage. The three to four leaf stage is our guideline Still keep an eye on things, but generally when you get to that point, especially if you get some soil moisture and the plants are able to um, produce that new growth, they can generally compensate well on their own uh, once you get to that point. It's getting there that uh, can be the challenge. So again, the, the next uh, a week or two will be critical for some. Uh, areas that did receive some rain uh, overnight, uh, that's going to really help things out because um, that will hopefully help you get to those more uh, resistant stages uh, quicker. So, like I said, keep keep scouting for the next couple of weeks. 25% uh, roughly is the the foliation level we use as a nominal threshold, and also consider uh, whether the stem cutting occurring and uh, how quickly your plants seem to be growing. Uh, days where we have uh, warm temperatures and there's not a lot of wind and it's not too humid, those are going to be your ideal feeding days for the flea beetle. So those are the days where you need to be paying extra attention to your crop. Okay, and a quick follow-up to that is um, uh, interval uh, between spraying. Um, how many days should I be waiting when I sprayed, let's say, four days ago and I go out and I see plants that are looking like this one here. Yeah, um, you really do need to be scouting. I don't have a number I can throw at you and say two days, three days, four days, because it depends not only on the insecticide, but on the weather conditions. When we get some of the really uh, hot weather, that can cause extra volatilization of the products. The residual might not be as long. So the environmental conditions do affect the residual of the products. So it's hard to throw a number and say uh, two days, three days, four days. Um, keep an eye on the field. You, hopefully you should get at least a couple of days out of uh, the spray. But I would say just keep checking those fields. I, I really can't give you a, a magic number because really there isn't one. Okay. And uh, Dane, I, if, uh, if you're on still, uh, the question I got yesterday was uh, uh, crop uh, the consultant was out and he was seeing um, as low as two plants per square foot and on some fields and then on the other fields he was seeing, you know, probably an average of four. Um, advice that when you should be making your reseed decision, how, how low of plants should we be looking at? Uh, well, Lionel, it, it really depends. Um, the Canola Council and, and Manitoba Agriculture's recommendation for a minimum plant stand is between five to seven plants per square foot. As you move later into the season, uh, a lower plant stand is uh, more likely to survive and as a result, more likely to achieve yield potential despite it being lower. So we often see successful yields of adult plant stands uh, at harvest time that are in the three to four plant per square foot range doing quite well. So at two to four plants per square foot, um, if that variation is relatively even across the field and we're not seeing areas that drop down to half or one and not areas that are you know climbing above seven or eight, if they're consistently in that two to four range, 
uh, that's that's pretty good for this time of year, considering the conditions that we faced. Um, if the plants are up and surviving, that also means that uh, there is potential yield there for later on in the year uh, to to terminate that crop and consider a reseed right now with a lower stand like that is generally not advisable. Um, because of a later seeding date, we have reduced yield potential. And we have no guarantees of any future weather. We know what we did have, and uh, that moisture that was there is being taken advantage of by that canola crop. So at two to four plants per square foot, just be cognizant and, and be uh, vigilant in scouting uh, because that canola crop will take more time to cabbage over and cover ground. So weed competition, flea beetle feeding, cutworm feeding, those sorts of things just need to be scouted for regularly. And there are still um, as good a potential there for, for a decent crop as, as any other. Okay, great. Thanks, Dane. Uh, for Dave Kaminsky, um, in the past years we've been adding fungicide to our canola herbicide application to help black clay control. We've tightened up our rotation due to canola prices, wherever the dry conditions. What is your opinion on adding a fungicide this spring? Okay, thanks Lionel. Uh, how many questions come after me? I'm cognizant of time and... Uh, uh, there's, a, uh, there's only a couple more. Okay. Well, um, before I jump to my slides, I'll just uh, continue on Lionel's slide here. If you self-identify as somebody who is pushing your canola rotation, um, then I think probably fungicide is justified, even in a dry spring. It doesn't take much moisture for infection to occur from visible pieces of canola stubble, which hang around in the soil or on the surface of the soil for up to four years. Uh, so the risk can be significant, even if it has been dry up to this point. Uh, now, if you can throw to me, I will uh, show you a few slides to illustrate what I've just said. And uh, can you see the next slides coming or can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see them, Dave. Okay. I just want to quickly review, um, black leg is, uh, as much as sclerotinia generally, the most uh, important disease that we deal with in canola uh, year over year. You can see that four years ago in 2017, sclerotinia and black leg were almost neck and neck in terms of prevalence. That is how many of the 160 some crops that we survey were infected with those diseases. Because it's been dry through the last three years, you see that stem rot, dropped significantly. On the other hand, black leg has actually increased slightly. So uh, dry conditions do not put black leg in check. Uh, next slide. Come on. So um, first of all, I have to credit the source here. This is from the Canola Council of Canada website. It's a relatively new infographic that shows the life cycle and tries to explain its complexity. And uh, I don't have a good pointer here, but if you can see my uh, pointer, this is the window you have for applying a foliar fungicide from the time the cotyledons have emerged to about the three or four leaf stage. Beyond that, you're not going to uh, have significant control. If infection occurs on the cotyledons or the youngest leaves, that's when the disease can get to the stem and cause the maximum damage. Uh, now we have to talk about stubble and how long those uh, spore producing structures known as pseudothesia survive on the stubble. Uh, from two years, um, only after four years do they begin to drop off. This picture down here is a little bit better for showing the actual structures. They're larger than pycnidia, which are these ones on the leaves. Pycnidia ooze spores and only spread by rain splash. The spores coming out of the sexual structures, ascospores, um, they get blown up into the air and moved by wind onto your developing crop. Uh, maybe that's enough said here. And I'll go on to a bigger picture. This uh, piece of canola stem here has both pseudothesia, those larger ones, and pycnidia, the littler ones. So you're gonna get hit both ways. And this is what the cross section of a canola infected plant looks like. There's a new disease on the horizon, Ruricillium wilt. 
reverse selling stripe, pardon me, but we won't talk about that one today. Um, in my little plot at the diagnostic school, I seeded canola on May the 5th, and of course the seed treatment ran out, so it was hammered by flea beetles. It reduced my stand to probably under that uh, three to four plants per square foot or meter threshold. So I have chosen to uh, reseed. That happened just last week on the second. And so these are the two stages that I have. If all of your crop is up and at the cotyledon stage, hold off spraying for a little while because um, you're not going to get much product onto anything that is going to hold the infect or hold the fungicide for a length of time. You want to have at least one or two leaves emerged. Um, did you carry over seed? I hope to hell not. Um, but your seed treatment is going to hang on when you late seeded like this. Uh, same as the uh, flea beetle protection, it will have worn off if it took your crop three weeks to get out of the round, the ground, pardon me. And finally, um, if you're gonna be using fungicides, you've gotta be really cognizant of those which pose a high risk of uh, resistance developing in the pathogen. Of course, there are other things that protect the plant, such as the resistance in your varieties. 99% of what we grow is rated as resistant. So let's just talk about fungicides. If you're using a strobilurin, a group 11 product only, you're at a high risk of uh, causing resistance in the pathogen. Um, group three products, uh, which are the older things, uh, Tilt is off patent, so there are a lot of Me Too products. That's propiconazole and all the triazoles, group threes. There's only a medium risk of uh, resistance developing. And some of the newer products are a two-way or even a three-way mix of uh, frac groups, that is the, the resistance groups. Again, we have that uh, vulnerable strobe in the mix, the group 11s. However, by mixing them with others, group three and group seven newer products, including this fluxopyrad, we can uh, fight against resistance development. Um, I don't know why I need that slide there. There's my contact information if you want to talk about Blackleg further, and I will throw it back to you, Lionel. Did I answer the question Great. completely, or is there more to it? Uh, no, I think uh, you covered what uh, what the producer was looking at. So, uh, okay. uh, Laurie, can just pass the screen back to me. Great. And uh, I think uh, what I'm going to do in the essence of time here is save the next question for next week. And I wanted to get this slide on for producers that are anybody that's uh, talking to producers. Uh, there's a program that's been announced for funding to support water source development. Uh, it's an environmental farm plan type program. So you would need to take your environmental farm plan or have an updated environmental farm plan. Uh, there's contact people there. There's Andrew Berthlett and Colleen Wilson if you've got questions, but basically it's for uh, development of uh, uh, construction or rehabilitating existing wells, dugouts, alternative watering systems, uh, and fencing to restrict access to surface water. So uh, definitely a lot of things that could help out if, if you're in a situation where you uh, might need uh, some water. Uh, Again, uh, spraying full force here, so everybody uh, grab a book so you can uh, look into the details that we've been talking about today. Our uh, Ag Adaptation Specialists and uh, happy retirement to Ingrid, who's gonna be leaving us. Uh, and there's our contact information. And join us next week, uh, June the 16th, for uh, the next edition of Crop Talk. Thanks for attending and thanks panel for being, being there to answer the questions.